All right. And before we get started, um, anything else from you, Nate? No, yeah, I'm, I, I'm excited to be here. It's like kind of my first rationalist related <laughs> conference, I think. So yeah, it's been fun to meet like kind of people I know and have read on the internet for a long time, and it's, it's great. I'm happy to hear that, yeah. Um, so Nate needs almost no introduction. He's the founder of 538, statistician, writer. Um, you guys probably almost all know him. Um, but yeah, thank you for being here with us, Nate. Of course. Um, all right, so let's just kind of get to it. Oh, uh, one final thing. Um, the, at the end, I'm going to ask Nate to pick his favorite questions out of all the questions that were asked. And the favorite question gets an additional 1,000 uh, mana bounty. So some additional incentive for asking good questions. Um, all right, um, getting started here, um, who should write a book? Uh, we have some prominent online writers uh, in attendance here, such as Scott Alexander, Bern Hobart, Patrick McKenzie. They haven't published a book as far as I can tell. Should they bother in a world where like, attention spans are like declining, fewer people read? Yeah, it's kind of weird. I can send some like stupid tweet out and it gets read you know, millions of times, right? But like a book that you like put two years into, um, you know, many books sell four figures or five figures. If you sell six figures, it's considered very, very good. Um, but look, I mean, I can give kind of like some like narrow, selfish reasons to write a book, right? Um, number one, it's like an excuse if you do books like I do where they involve like talking to a lot of people or practitioners or experts. It's an excuse to have lots of really cool conversations with people that you wouldn't ordinarily think to do, right? Like pick their brain about prediction markets or about sports betting or about venture capital or whatever else. Um, Number two, like it does give you some, I mean, so one thing a book does, like it's a big marketing event around you, which can lead to other opportunities. It can lead to um, things like paid talks, for example. Um, it can lead to things like consulting. It can lead to things like, um, you know, I've started talking with people about like screenplays and things like that, right? Um, but number three, I think most importantly, like it gives you the opportunity to kind of as an adult to go back to school and really kind of like spend a lot of time learning about something and telling a story, and particularly a story that only you feel like you can tell, right? Like, the intersection of things I'm writing about in my book, I feel like, are, are very uniquely me, and there are, like, not other people, very, very many, who would have access to the same knowledge base that I have, um, the same, like, I'm not a big networker, but, like, the fact is that, like, there are certain people, like, in this space that, like, I'll talk to and have, like, a more down-to-earth conversation with that a regular journalist might not, and so, I don't know, I, I you know, look, um, I think if you do the type of book that isn't just like a long magazine article, then it's worth doing. That's also a lot harder than the, the other type of book. Cool. Um, I'm going to jump a little bit to like a related question. So you have been working on a new book, by the way. Um, yeah. I, yeah uh, to be published in 2024, I think? Yes, 2024. Cool. Uh, what is it about? Um, what topics does it cover? Uh, how are you hoping it will be received? Um, so the book is about gambling and risk is the tagline. I sometimes say gambling, risk, and rationality, depending on who I'm talking to. Um, I can like, give you like the literal like chapter outline. Um, the first two chapters are about poker. I'm a former professional poker player. It's kind of my lodestar in a lot of ways. Um, the th third chapter is about actually the casino industry that is kind of not written about very well. The fourth chapter is on sports betting. So that's the first half. That half is, is done, right? Um, Chapter five is about venture capital in Silicon Valley, more or less. It's what I'm like literally writing, um, starting to write that this week. Um, chapter six is about crypto and kind of the pandemic era booms and lots of things, but um, partly about crypto and the collapse of FTX. Uh, chapter seven is about basically EA and uh, the rationalist movement, so that's very adjacent to here. Um, chapter eight's about existential risk, and then there's a conclusion about kind of like progress in capitalism. Um, so I've done the, the fun half in the first, the, the gambling part is done, the risk <laughs> part, most of the interviews are done, so the research is done. It's a very research intensive book, but I have to spend most of my next three months like just writing, writing that up. Uh, it's surprising to me that like if the second half of the book involves like you know rationality, X risk, these other things, this is your first time coming to like a event like this. Yeah, I mean it's it's part of the book is like discovering kind of where your um, adjacencies are and kind of what your quote unquote community is, right? Like in in the outline of the book, there's like a whole chapter on COVID, right? That's now been reduced to you know probably three pages or something like that, right? Because the news cycles moved on and kind of my interests have moved on. Um, you know, I didn't think there would be as much about X risk and effective altruism and rationality as there was, as there turned out to be. But it's also kind of like, you know, who is taking your cold emails or who is emailing you and kind of, you know, where do your networks kind of naturally flow? Even the VC part, like, um, 
you know, the VCs really like to talk and they're and they're very candid, and so they're more interested in me writing a book than like the hedge fund people are are much more guarded, right? So there are biases when you write a book about like kind of who is in your network and who will talk to you and who won't. Um, but I'm kind of trying to like start out with poker very literally and then kind of follow every tributary of that and see where it see where it leads to. Uh, cool. One more question about your book. What's been your favorite like you know story that you've gotten out of it? It's the problem with like being in this stage of writing a book is that like you are very very close to it, right? So I mean, I, look, I've been in crazy situations. I was in with SBF in like a darkening room in the Bahamas, right? Uh, <laughs> you know, I was at some secret VC conference in Utah, right? Which I guess is no longer secret. Whoops. Oops. Uh, <laughs> the existence of the conference was on the record, so the, the participant list was not, right? Um, I was uh, playing poker with billionaires, and so it's like very participatory. You know, I had like some fun like poker tournament runs and things like that, right? So it's kind of, it's partly autobiographical and participatory. Um, and kind of being in the scene, I mean, you know, I was doing some like crypto related stuff when that was kind of popping off in like Miami and things like that. So it's like being in a time and a place and trying to link ideas, right? Like I'm not gonna write the best book about like, oh, what is probability of doom from AI, right? But what I can do is like explain the lineage of that thinking and why one person might think it's 98%, one person might think it's 2% and kind of, and where that discussion comes from, right? Or if you think Elon Musk is crazy, or SBF is crazy, right? Kind of where does that mentality come from, and, and what are its what are its pitfalls and limitations as well? Very cool. Um, yeah, I'm very looking forward to it. Um, all right, we're going to switch topics a little bit. Uh, you've recently moved off of five thirty eight. What do you most regret about your time there, and what are you most proud of? Ooh, good question. Um, although good sometimes means it's a hard question to answer. I mean, look, I um, well, look, I think there were a couple of. <clears throat> mistakes, um, you know, one of which is like, I think we focused, well, first of all, one mistake is that we didn't really have a business strategy of any kind <laughs> whatsoever, right? Um, ESPN bought 538 in the days when ESPN thought of itself as like the best, most infallible business in the world, right? That they print money from cable subscriptions and from, and from sports leagues, and which is thought to be very robust, and they kind of said, Nate, you're gonna come in and, and you're kind of a made man now. Don't really worry about like making money or anything like that, right? Which, which is great until ESPN hits, hits all these headwinds from, um, from the cable bundle breaking up, right? Um, from COVID, from a million other things. And, and um, so, you know, it's always risky going to business when no one actually has like a business plan for you, right? I think the second part is like, you know, I am ironically like someone who's best known for covering politics who kind of quote unquote doesn't like politics and I can kind of parse what that means, right? Um, I think elections are interesting and forecasting is interesting, right? I think the kind of like game theory of how political actors behave is interesting, but like I'm kind of a normie in terms of like, I don't care about the state of the union address and things like that, right? Um, you know, I don't think it's necessarily good when the population's paying more attention to politics as opposed to public policy, right? Um, but like, I think we kind of like got trapped. It's kind of an audience capture problem, right? You get all these kind of like political nerds. When I think I wanted maybe the other kind of nerds instead, even though even though that like that market is smaller, I think it kind of speaks more to my core. And then if you kind of you know if you wind up hiring a bunch of people who are like writing about politics, and you kind of tend to get like a certain type of of person, I guess, and like, so I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, I wish it had been like more about, that we covered more about like forecasting markets and like poker and tech and things like that. And if there's another version of 538, then maybe it would, but I'm kind of happy for right now, like working on this book and and, and my Substack. Uh, yeah, uh, on that note about like politics, uh, I think I was talking with somebody about the difference between like politics like predicted comment section and the like manifold comment section. Manifold is kind of like the forecasting place. Um, there's a, like a pretty yeah. big difference like civility, uh, I think, when it comes to like yeah. non-political betting. No, and look, and I, you know, look, obviously we are in a room that is very optimistic about the future of prediction markets. I mean, directionally, I probably am relative to the average person, for sure. Um, there is something nice about having a like-minded, medium-sized community of people who are really interested, right? Um, like it's kind of funny now. Like you kind of go uh, from 538 and start a Substack, and you kind of start from with zero people, right? I mean, you know, you collect some people from like the Twitter funnel, but actually Twitter kind of like throttles Substack traffic, and so it's it's not as high as you would think. But like it's actually nice. Like now you go back to where like the post is being read by a number of people, where you get like an actually like pretty robust 
good discussion in the comments section, right? If it gets 10 times bigger, then, which hopefully one day it will be, then maybe the comments will become less useful again. But like, but yeah, look, this is all, part of my thing is like, um, I had an ex-boss in a kind of drunken moment one time, right, said, Nate, you're like 10 times more well-known than you should be, right? <laughs> <laughs> it was intended to be nice, but like kind of maybe kind of one in every 10 persons kind of, kind of understands more or less what I'm doing, and nine out of 10 people look at our election forecast for like, for partisan reasons, or because it's like exciting to like click and refresh, and so so, you know, to have like very large scale, especially if your company never bothered to like run advertisements on the millions and millions of pages you get every day, is is not necessarily a great problem to have. Cool. Um, jumping uh, topics a bit, do you think real money prediction markets should be legalized in the United States? Oh sure, yeah, yeah. I mean that's an easy, that's an easy question. Yeah, cool. because people now, I mean people are trading these things anyway, right? Just in very kind of, just in very clumsy ways. Uh, yeah, that, that to me seems like a, like a layup for sure. Um, and to extend that one, like have you traded on real money prediction markets? What is your uh, interaction with those? Um, I've done a fair bit of sports betting. Uh, I, um, I haven't, no, the short answer is no, I haven't ever traded on political markets because like my previous two employers were ABC News and the New York Times. Um, they were strict and would not have let me do that, right? Also, like, uh, well, there are really three reasons, right? That's one reason. Reason number two is, like, um, I actually have a lot of skin in the game reputationally anyway, so I don't know if I want to necessarily add more money or if you, maybe you might want to hedge, potentially. Um, like, number three is I worry, I worry a little bit about what the ethics are of if you're, like, a market mover, you know what I mean? I, I haven't kind of fully thought that through. I mean, again, I bet sports, including on, based on models that we publish, right? But like, sports is very robust and like, and like, it's, you know, it's not like an absolute, like, oh, if we ever affected anything, right? But with, with politics, I mean, it, it gets a little icky, I think, and so, and so, and so I don't know. Um, with that said, you know, I'm thinking about like, maybe next year I wanna like, um, actually work with like a hedge fund or, or a betting syndicate and like actually bet the election, so I'm definitely not, Philosophically opposed, but I'll have to kind of clarify my sense on how I write about that publicly. Cool. Sorry? Okay, sorry. Yeah. Great. Cool. Um, now, here's a question. Um, you mentioned, again, that you don't like politics as men much as many of your readers do. So you have this new Substack. What are the topics that you're most excited to cover? Um, I mean, the idea is that you would kind of cover some politics, most election stuff, right? You'd cover some sports stuff, you'd cover some, um, some kind of rationality and AI adjacent stuff, um, some personal stuff, like the weird personal stuff does surprisingly well a lot of the time, um, and some about the media where I have, you know, I have had an interesting journey in the media, and so I actually have, I think, somewhat informed takes. What's happened is that, like, I just have so much muscle memory for covering politics that, like, if I have three hours on a flight somewhere, right, it's just a lot easier to like kind of spend those three hours writing a politics post. And so I intend for um, for the Substack to cover a more diverse range of topics than it has in the past month or so. While I'm working on the book, I mean, like you're using like the CPU cycles you use for writing that go on your Substack, like kind of trade off pretty one for one with like work you do on the book. So like that's kind of why I'm like I'm going for somewhat low hanging fruit, right? Um, but I'd love to cover more of the stuff that some of the other people I read, Svi and Scott and people like that, are, are covering and, and have ways to weigh in there. Cool. Um, all right, so I think I'm obligated to ask this question. Does it matter that prediction markets are mostly run by Scottish teens? How can they expand <laughs> their audience and who should their audience be? Disclosure, I bet yes on the will Nate Silver say the words Scottish teens at manifest. <laughs> <laughs> so, what if I say like Scottish lads? No, Scottish teens are. <laughs> Our stereotype, I think, of like offshore. <laughs> Resolved, yes. There we go. <laughs> they are a running joke about the types of people that we think are trading on these markets and like political affairs. And what's the actual question? What's you supposed to say? <laughs> um, I mean, how can they expand their. I mean, look, I, I think with like. Election betting markets, those have, I think, fairly broad audiences, right? In fact, if you look, talk to like sports bettors, where can you actually make money betting sports? It's kind of like a, a U, right? Um, if you're betting like Uzbekistani ping pong, 
then you can beat those markets, except they'll ban you the minute that you do, right? But in principle, you can beat that. If you're betting the Super Bowl, like actually, um, there is enough dumb money in the Super Bowl that the market doesn't clear, and you actually have probably a positive EV bet if you can just figure out kind of where the public money is and fading the public, right? Elections are kind of on that side of the U where like there is so much amateur interest in election money that like I'm not I'm not that worried about that type of market, right? And also I think it's kind of like I think in certain ways like presidential election markets and like Brexit markets kind of in some ways kind of give prediction markets a bad name because they're dominated by by relatively dumb money. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, whereas things like figuring out like on the night of a special election as results are coming in, to have people who are dedicated to figuring out kind of which precinct is coming in from where, and they're very good about that kind of thing, right? They're very good about like medium-sized elections, whereas presidential elections, I mean, historically, um, like 538 does very, very well in presidential elections, which, you know, kind of violates the notion of like efficient markets. It's kind of very, very, very prominent, very public resource is beating the markets. Like it's kind of like not supposed to happen, but the reason why is because like there are a lot of people with money to burn and strong opinions about politics that aren't particularly well informed. It's not like you have like, you know, there are probably thousands of people building models to beat the NBA, right? Not millions, but thousands, right? And there might be 20 people who might build an election model or something like that. It's probably not, not the same scale. Very cool. Um, all right, uh, next question. What prediction markets or forecasting platforms have helped you with your modeling and your writing? And how could these be more helpful? I mean, like, you guys are helpful because you have, like, well-formulated questions. So, like, if I'm writing, like, a substack, then to, like, be able to say, okay, here is a highly specific question they want to, like, gain insight on, right? And I think people can sometimes use, like, prediction markets as as a crutch. But and no. when we say you guys, like, do you mean, like, what specific platforms? Like, do you go to Metaculous, Cauchy, Manifold, Polymarket? All, all of the above, yeah. I don't want. I know. I, I kind of know people in these different spaces. I don't want to like get myself in 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 too much trouble. <laughs> all yeah. right, very safe. Yeah. Um, but no, I mean, look, I, I think they're they're you know they're definitely great for discussion, right? I mean, I think you know, look, there is such a thing as like when you fail to provide like any alpha, right? To just say, okay, here are the prices, and let's have. I mean, that might be that might be a very low effort kind of Substack post, right? If I'm like really pressed for time or something. Um, but they're great ways to like kind of to frame questions for sure. Cool. Um, how could they be more helpful? Um, I should probably have come prepared with an answer oh. to that, potentially. Um, yeah, look, I mean, you know, I know people have talked more about, like, if you can somehow kind of extract the rationale for why people are making certain types of predictions. I think the problem with that is, like, you sometimes don't want to give away your rationale, right? That's where you kind of have your, your alpha and where you have your secret sauce. Um, you know, yeah, I, I, I think, uh, I don't know. I mean, with elections, it's kind of a little bit more obvious in, <laughs> in certain ways, right? Um, but I don't have a great answer beyond that. No worries. Um, moving on to the 538 question then. Uh, what's the most counterintuitive feature of the 538 forecasting model? I mean, in some ways, our job isn't to be counterintuitive, right? It's kind of in the cycle where everyone is... Um, very emotional about the election. It's just to kind of say, hey, look, let's look at the polls, figure out empirically what's the correlation between different states and empirically how accurate is a polling average X number of days away from, from the election, right? Um, and people find that very counterintuitive even when it isn't <laughs> necessarily, right? Um, yeah, look, I mean, one thing I've learned is kind of answering a different question, I guess, right? But like, how many different ways people interpret a probabilistic statement, relative to which are actually accurate in some ways. I mean, you know, I mean, people are not. Um, most consumers are not that interested in in accuracy for accuracy's sake, right? So if you're in this room and you're like one of those people, just like, hey, look, it's just kind of in my DNA that I just want to be precise and accurate and correct at the end of the day. Like that's not how most people think. Um, you know, m a lot of people participate in politics to like signify kind of who they are as a person. Um, which, you know, again, is why I think having like skin in the game is a very, is a very good thing, but like, um, I don't know if it's counterintuitive at all, but like kind of, I've become more disillusioned about kind of who the consumer for even relatively sophisticated political, political news is. Cool. Uh, with that, uh, I'll probably transition away from the, well, actually maybe one more. Um, 
like many people in the audience, uh, IIRC, uh, if you recall, if I recall correctly, you consider yourself to be solidly in the Bayesian camp, philosophically speaking. <laughs> what do you consider to be the strongest arguments against Bayesianism? Uh, oh, geez. I, look, I don't know if this is kind of Bayesianism at all, or kind of maybe narrow empiricism. But like, I you know, I do wonder if uh, we've moved to a world where the default is to become so Bayesian and so empirical that kind of all the profits have been arbitraged out, and particularly in kind of, I mean, this is maybe more of a problem with frequentist cases, though. So I don't know. I mean, you know, it's hard to kind of know what your reference classes are, right? But that's not uniquely a Bayesian problem either. So I, again, I'm not answering these questions very well. No worries. I'm with a shot. Uh, all right. At this point, I'd like to open it up to questions um, just in the room. Um, does anyone have anything they'd like to ask uh, Nate Silver? Uh, question over there. Spiciest takes on the upcoming U.S. election? Uh, it's going to be fucking... I mean, assuming that it's Trump versus Biden, which is like probably a 70% probability or 65 or something like that, then like it's the same two candidates. Voters know all the information they would have wanted to know about these candidates they already know, right? Um, so it's going to be, I think, like annoying and tedious and be very like, like lots of meta debates about like what's the role of forecasting? What's the role of journalism and things like that? And I kind of, I kind of hate those types of things. That's, you know, I don't know. It's like, it's actually like a very unrewarding election for, unrewarding election for forecasting, right? For, for various reasons. One being that like, it's I think not gonna have a lot of movement or volatility, right? Um, so it's kind of less fun in that way, right? But also like, it probably is gonna be 60-40-ish or 50-50-ish, right? I'd love to have Reagan Mondale in 1984, right? Where like, Reagan is like 99.6% to win by Labor Day, and all the Mondale people are really mad at me, but in the end, you know, there's a 99.6% chance that my prediction looks good, whereas it's 50-50, you're kind of totally fucked half the time, right? <laughs> and the incentives are asymmetric. You get like way more crap for being wrong, or at least I do, than for being right. And so like, so I don't know if the incentives are for me to like publicly make a forecast, to be honest. Wow. Um, I certainly don't like enjoy that part anymore exactly. I mean, yeah, so so yeah, 50-50 election with the same matchup as last time with people, I think understandably being very invested in the outcome, but you know, to become kind of like a, a avatar for people's like anxiety is like is like not a great personal experience necessarily. That does seem pretty spicy. Um, any other questions for Nate? Now we can go through a few more from the bounty market. Um, would you consider moving more directly into projects to help reduce existential risk? This one seems pretty popular among uh, people here, at least. I mean, look, I kind of have to think about where my comparative advantage is, right? Um, you know, I think this book is something where I have a lot of comparative advantage because I can like contextualize different communities for for one another, right? Um, as a journalist, something about like being that explicitly kind of goal oriented seems, I don't know, like a little hard for me. You know what I mean? Like, like I would like never go work for like a political campaign, right? It's just kind of not the way that you're like that my DNA is built, right? It's more like, I can like explore this world and provide like a, the most accurate map of this world that you've seen, right? And I have some degree of confidence that like, you know, people will become kind of more rational, obviously a very loaded term as a result, and as a result of being more rational, then by some second order effect, they'll be appropriately more concerned about existential risk, right? Um, but like, you know, I'm trying to like tell the story of, you know, again, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, the short answer is maybe in the long term, yeah, and like part of what you're trying to do is kind of see what paths feel like warm and which paths feel cooler, and like this path like does feel a lot warmer, and I think kind of overall more public attention should be given to existential risk for sure, right? And the book kind of might accomplish that, but that's an, in, that's an indirect knockoff effect and not like kind of why I'm writing the book. 
Um, I actually don't really have this background. What kind of got you into the like X risk, like rationalist side? Would you say you've always been a part of that community or? A little. I mean, look, uh, I think I read the Nick Bostrom book back in the day and the Toby Ord book, and that's kind of how it kind of reached a lot of people in the mainstream. Um, but also, like, there are a lot of overlaps between, like, you know, poker people going into EA and and the hedge fund guys I'm in the poker game with being into prediction mark. And just so, like, there are, it's the same type of nerds in all these different communities, right? Similar types of nerds, except maybe the VCs are, like, a little bit more, like, Social, right? <laughs> um, but it's just kind of like trying to discover that personality type, and this personality type, in some ways, is like, is very powerful and very influential, and which I think is is not well understood by kind of like New York, Boston, Washington, more politically minded establishment types, and trying to like, trying to introduce kind of these overlapping worlds to people in ways that like, like people are going to be mad because like, there are going to be figures in the book that like the political left doesn't like that like I treat neutrally or sympathetically or as a journalist complicatedly, right? And and so maybe that will get me some bad reviews, but I feel like I have an obligation to like kind of to describe this mode of thinking that I kind of have always implicitly believed in, I guess. Um, and is very influential and very powerful, but like is often misdescribed and, you know, like the New York Times articles or whatever on like, you know, on like Slate Starts Codex or whatever are like just Terrible on every possible level, right? They don't under ha, they show no understanding of the community that they're writing about, right? And they take a lot of like anxieties of a different of the New York Times kind of class of people and like and mold them onto this community to which they don't really apply. And so to have an opportunity to like kind of like describe poker even in like terms that are are just I think more accurate by actually knowing what I'm talking about is is a big opportunity. Cool. Um, all right, I see some hands for questions. I'm going to go with um, Brock. Um, thanks. Um, so you mentioned a little bit about ESPN, uh, ESPN's... You mentioned a little bit about ESPN's changing economic fortunes at the beginning, and I'm wondering if you have other predictions for the future of media, and also specifically if there's any hope for local media, which has been, like, stagnating. I mean, if, you know, this was talked about a little bit in the last session, but, like, the fact is that like some parts of media are vastly more profitable than others, and so like, um, and so the kind of the bundling of like of like local media with Taylor Swift uh, reporting is like actually good for like local reporting, right? And it's kind of that bundle has first the kind of local advertising bundle collapse, and and now you have like a few very large players like the New York Times, but apart from that, um, it's sort of collapsing as well. I mean, look, I mean like. Look, Substack is great in a lot of ways. It's great for like writer independence. It's great for like nerdy, like niche topics, right? It's like not probably not great for like local reporting in Tulsa, Oklahoma, or something like that. Um, you know, look, I think a lot of the solution might ultimately come from philanthropy. Um, you have people. It's not that expensive actually to like run a newspaper as compared to a lot of things. And so I think people. I mean, you know, you know, I personally think that government subsidies run into conflicts where do you want people reporting on on their funders but like you know i i don't know i don't i don't see i don't have any magic solutions to like the decline in, in local news coverage cool um another question back there Obviously, you've thought a lot about risk, and a lot of the examples in your book and that you've mentioned are very kind of atomized, like making a bet in poker, making a bet in sports gambling, making a concrete prediction if you're a hedge fund guy or a VC or whatever. But I wonder if you have any thoughts or if there's going to be anything in your book about kind of the, the fuzzier kind of risks we take in everyday life. You know, should I be getting married to this person? What is it like, as you know, to start a new business? That's an enormous risk, but it's not, it's different in the way that it, it's, it's not like a bet that pays out in a very discreet way, the yeah. way that a poker hand does. So I'm just curious if you have thoughts about like life risk and the paths that people take and, and how risk applies to everyone's life in that sense. So there's a little bit of discussion of that. Like I'm talking, for example, about the kind of trade-off that we seem to be now making in the US where we have growing GDP but declining life expectancy, right? Um, you have for maybe the first time in um, history, kind of the younger generation is actually more risk averse than like the older generation. 
Um, now, if I'm being honest, like the scope of the book is already too large. It's already like it's already like basically the kind of first half of the book could have been its own book, the second half could be its own book, and so like it's kind of more like I wouldn't say window dressing, but like a little bit of context in the intro and the conclusion, more than like a through line throughout. Um, but of course, I mean, kind of you know, you know, part of the book is trying to encourage people to take more risk, I and mean, it's a very elevator pitchy version of it. But that comes with like lots and lots of of complicated kind of context, and also just a matter of like, um, you know, look as kind of parts of the world become more risk averse, there is in some ways like more rewards to risk taking, right? So like the kind of bifurcation of risk that we saw, you know, during COVID, I and mean, that's kind of I'm reading from the intro now, right? But where half people go into a shell, half people go YOLO, right, and go totally bonkers, right, very risk on. That bifurcation, I think, is starting to separate people socially and economically in other ways. So that's, that's kind of the context for sure. Speaking of COVID, uh, what do you think the probability is that COVID was a lab leak? Uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 70%, I think. I mean, there have been like Bayesian, I mean, so there, isn't there like a manifold market on this or there's some, yeah, which yeah. is like 80? <laughs> Yeah. I Take mean, it in, like, I guess, how you would interpret it. I mean, I interpret that as, like, something that at one point was in, like, a laboratory in Wuhan, <laughs> China, and it was there before it was in, like, the, the wet market or whatever, right? I mean, I, I would think that would include a case where, like, you're, like, a live sample of a bat or something, and then, and then it was contaminated that way. I guess it's a little bit ambiguous. Um, I mean, there have been, like, pretty good Bayesian analyses of it. Like, what actually, one problem with, like, a lot of things now, and, like, I know how this pertains to prediction markets, is, like, like the lab leak is kind of one of those things where it's like it's a little bit hard to go kind of halfway <laughs> on it, right? And I kind of have tried to like to some degree like pull back from like COVID stuff because it's still like extremely polarizing. But like the basic original kind of that John Stewart got semi canceled for formulation, like, hey, you have this happening in the city where you have this extremely prominent research laboratory for exotic coronaviruses, like that ought to affect your priors quite a bit, right? Um, who was like Michael Weissman or somebody had like a good kind of Bayesian paper saying like, if you really are being Bayesian about this and like, then it comes out pretty strongly in favor of, of lab leak and it's just a matter of like, of like, you know, how much uncertainty you kind of bake into your, into your priors, but, but yeah. Cool. Um, looking at time, we can probably do uh, one more audience question. Um, let's go over there. Hi, Nate. Um, so in your newsletter recently, you talked about how you still have some ownership of the model yeah. um, and have you know, explored thinking about maybe selling or licensing access to it. Um, and that's pretty exciting just as you know, maybe one, a very different ma like manifestation of the idea of like forecasting as a service, potentially a new business model. I was wondering, how would you characterize like the customer universe potentially um, for your model? Like who do you think might be interested in having access to it? How might they use it, et cetera? I mean, there are various customers, right? I mean, look, so there's basically kind of three cases, right? One is someone who wants the model as a top of funnel to draw like a very large number of people to their site, right? Um, because it does get a lot of traffic, a lot of attention, a lot of eyeballs. Model two is that you um, sell it to paying subscribers of some kind, right? You can decide exactly how high you want to set that threshold, right? It could be a $6 a month Substack, or it could be like a $250 a month like intelligence kind of thing, right? And a third market is like people could want to like bet on it directly. So you're just using it to like um, for hedge funds or consulting or for gambling interest, right? Maybe you sell to them, maybe you license it to them. And so like, like all three of those are still on the table. Like perversely in some ways, like the first one where it's like extremely public in some ways, I don't know if I want it to be so public for the incentive reasons we talked about before, you know, I do think like a paywall would, um, would uh, the self-selection effect I think would be very good, right? If you are not just interested as like kind of a fan, but like you're willing to pay X dollars a month for it, then like, then you're kind of capturing that like 10% of users, or probably not 10%, but you know, the 2% of users who are like are actually, um, who are actually able to interpret those forecasts um, correctly. And then you can provide a lot of very careful context to the other people. Um, when you put a number out there, a lot more people read the number, read the headlines, and kind of read the detailed analysis, right? So you have to be kind of very careful about the information engineering to avoid that. Cool. 
Um, thank you so much, Nate. Uh, before we wrap this up, which of these questions was your favorite? Oh, yeah. I'll just go with the, the first question about the book, because I think books have gotten like a little bit underrated, right? Um, it wasn't like SBF was like, oh, yeah, books aren't really, aren't really worth reading, right? And kind of, I mean, this community and I were like, you know, actually, one thing I've learned in my current book is like, a lot of these communities are actually pretty small, right? You don't need to know that many people to know like a lot of the most important people in any given sector. Um, you know, the people in this room have like, I think way more influence than they would think potentially. And so like, you know, having just worked for gigantic news organizations, ESPN, The New York Times, and ABC News for the last 12 years, like writing for like a medium-sized influential community people have like a lot of power to influence the course of human events is like, I think actually like a pretty good strategy. Cool. All right. Thank you so much, Nate. <laughs>